Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jamie Levitt, and I am chair of the board of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. On behalf of my fellow board members and our amazing staff, I welcome you to the 20th annual and hopefully first and only virtual Law and Society event. Thank you for joining us in celebration of community service. We gather today to recognize two extraordinary leaders in our community, Jamie McKeon and Eric Grossman, for their commitment to creating a more fair and just society. 2020 reminded me just how important NILPI's work really is. As it always does, NILPI rose to meet the urgent challenges of the moment and to join with communities who are ready to mobilize for assistance, but for real change. And NILPI's unique combination of law, community organizing, and the force of the private bar, all of you here today, are what makes change happen for New Yorkers in need. I'm proud to share a few examples of our work from the past year. We took action for environmental and racial justice. With the notorious Rikers Island Jail finally slated to close, Nilpi is leading a campaign to transform Rikers from a contaminated island into a green infrastructure zone, creating thousands of jobs and a positive space for New Yorkers. And we took action for immigrant justice. When COVID-19 turned immigration detention centers into toxic zones, NILPI mobilized a volunteer network of nearly 200 medical providers to advocate for emergency release. We rapidly expanded this effort to jails as well and won the release of many at-risk people. We took action for mental health justice. After far too many deaths at the, hand of the hands of the police, NILPI has made it an urgent priority to shift mental health response in New York City from the police to public health professionals. And we are advocating for the community in shaping this life-saving public health issue. And finally, we took action to build vibrant nonprofits. As all of you know, the pandemic and economic crisis hit nonprofits and small businesses particularly hard. NILPI's work hand in hand with member firms provided critical legal advice to helping those organizations access financial lifelines like PPP loans and more. So all of you, with your time, your pro bono efforts, your outreach to elected officials and your generosity helped make these and other social justice efforts a reality. Our honorees also embody this commitment to the law as a force for good. Jamie is chair of Morgan Lewis, the largest law firm in the world led by a woman, and she's often heralded for her commitment to pro bono, diversity, and the advancement of women in the law. In addition to serving on numerous nonprofit boards, as you will hear later this afternoon, Jamie, and Ch Jamie champions pro bono initiatives, including her firm's Mobilizing for Equality Task Force. Jamie is dedicated to the pursuit of equal justice for underserved communities, and through her leadership, she is helping to make that happen. And Eric, Eric creates community wherever he goes. And I know that well from our shared commitment to educational equity for New York City's most underprivileged students. Eric contributes his time and his leadership to public interest organizations and justice-minded bar associations while serving as Morgan Stanley's chief legal officer and a member of the firm's operating and management committees. Eric truly does it all. He is a compassionate and generous leader and a role model for lawyers hoping to create meaningful change in society. And Jamie and Eric joined past Law and Society honorees whom we sadly lost in 2020, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and former Solicitor General Drew Days whose legacies of justice we all strive to meet. And so finally, I want to convey our enormous gratitude to the staff at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. You have worked tirelessly on the front lines of this crisis and have done so much good for those who need it most. You have our collective respect and our thanks. And now I'm pleased to play a short video showcasing some of Nopi's work. Thank you again for helping us honor Eric and honor Jamie and for supporting this great civil rights organization. I hope to see you all again in person soon. Thank you.
we talk about mental health responses. All mental health calls go to 911, which are police. When police come to a call, they come to it like a crime scene. Multiple cops, there's sirens, and they come with their uniforms, tasers, and weapons. And you call for someone who has a heart attack or a stroke, an ambulance shows up, and they give you care. Police come in as if I'm a criminal. We are people. People, human beings, people in crisis. I'm a person who lives with a mental health condition. When I watched Miguel Richards' video, I was really scared because the cops came for a wellness check. The man's house was invaded by police. He didn't do anything wrong. And what we need is more of a conversation when we're in crisis. It's not a criminal response that you're responding to. It's a public health response. What do we want? Not police response. Systemic racism has an effect on social determinants of health for black and brown people. In the course of a five-year period, 14 hours out of 16 people who were killed by cops were black and brown people. Correct Crisis Intervention today had several forums where they invited people from the mental health community to actually talk about valid concerns about interaction with police. And nobody was there, which was fantastic. And that's how they actually connected with CCIT NYC. And we work alongside each other just to advocate for the community. But we listen to the peers and we listen to the mental health community to figure out their concerns so we can amplify their voices. Too often policies are actually designed and implemented without our input and they do more harm than good. There's nothing about us without us. We meet with elected officials continuously. We meet with community advocates. We rally to accomplish the goal at the end of the day of protecting people. Nilby has connections and resources and is able to access body cam footage of Kawasi Trawick, Susan Muller, and Miguel Richards. This was so critical to our advocacy because they show that people are dying unnecessarily. It empowers the community, the mental health community, to take action. It keeps the elected officials and our key stakeholders on notice and let them know that we're always watching and listening. Nilby led the efforts in CCIT for the public advocate to change his position to have a more non-police response aligned with our CCIT NYC model. The city proposed a pilot program for alternative responses to mental health calls. They want to use EMT workers who are very connected to police, which we don't want. Also, the city wants to use a 911 call for the dispatcher to decide who call gets routed to. We hope that the city will be able to work with us so we can have a model that is more designed for the benefit of the community. What I see for the future is having an alternative number for mental health calls like 988. I see 24-7 mental health clinics on the corner like city MDs, respite centers where peers can drop off anytime they want when they're having a crisis as an alternative to go into the hospital or calling 911. I see more supportive housing for people in the community. That's what the future is going to look like for the people in the mental health community with Nilpi at our side. The CARES Act was signed into law on Friday, March 27th. The CARES Act was incredibly important because quarantine lockdowns really just exacerbated the inequalities that we already knew existed, impacting low-income communities and communities of color with respect to the survival of small businesses and small nonprofits. The funding that was available and certain of the tax provisions and employment law provisions were exceptionally important to trying to prop up those businesses as they tried to maintain their employees and their staffs. When working with Nilpi, we really tried to tap into that New York City focused community need. And Nilpi was there and has such a deep relationship with the New York City community that they were able to help us walk through what those nonprofits were facing. We put together this manual and from there things just started to grow. Nilpi has been working with me round the clock to try and shape webinars that are responsive to what New York City nonprofits need, to what New York City small businesses need, to develop short accessible fact sheets on the various changes to the law, on the forgiveness program, and even to think through how we can deliver this on different types of platforms in different languages. We've done individual consults in Arabic, Mandarin, in Spanish. We've done webinars in Spanish. Nilpi is constantly monitoring the feedback and the chatter amongst their clients and delivering those messages back to us so that we can shape things that are useful. I think Nilpi is special because of its commitment to developing relationships both within the community and with the law firms that it partners with and without organizations like Nopi who are making this connection between the law firm and the nonprofits who need us most, we just wouldn't be able to do it. Welcome. 
My name is McGregor Smythe, and I'm Executive Director of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. I can't thank you enough for joining us today to celebrate our communities, our staff, and our partnership with Jamie and Eric. This last year laid bare desperate inequalities in tragic ways. COVID-19, economic crisis, and overdue reckoning on racial justice. 2020 demanded immediate responses to urgent need and a community-led vision for just recovery. We met this moment with all of you at our side, mobilizing the resources and power of hundreds of organizations, a thousand pro bono attorneys, and tens of thousands of community members. Together, we achieved real change. It was change measured on the scale of New York, like the 220,000 Black and Latinx public high school students in our class action challenging racial discrimination in high school sports or the 144,000 paratransit riders with disabilities protected after our coalition won new pandemic safety protocols. And change measured on the scale of real New Yorkers, like our client Jose. We met Jose in the hospital recovering from emergency heart surgery. He'd been denied a heart transplant because of concerns of his immigration status and continued health coverage. He came to the US from Honduras at age 16 as an unaccompanied child after a decade of abuse by his stepfather and uncle. Nopi expedited his case for asylum because of his urgent health condition, and he won asylum last year, released from an immigration shelter and reunited with his mother after being separated since he was six years old. And now we're thrilled to share that he received a heart transplant just two weeks ago and is recovering well. It's the trials of the last year and our collective response that bring such hope for the next. It's a hope that comes from the current mobilization in the face of injustice and the growing awakening to the systemic racism that's the original sin of this nation. Led by community priorities, we focus on their vision of health, immigrant, disability, and environmental justice. Now, these struggles for justice require creative solutions. So we litigate and educate, we organize and mobilize, and we use the power of the private bar to make change happen. Before we hear from two more incredible community partners, I urge you to join us in this moment of hope and opportunity for the critical work still ahead. You've taken action for justice just by coming today, and we need you now more than ever to make the promise of change a reality. So join us, get involved, and multiply our impact. I hope that you are inspired by Christina and Catherine, Chanel and Brandon, understanding that we act with, not for, beside, not in front, we're led by the voices of our communities because they have the power and vision to achieve change. The U.S. immigration detention system is actually one of the largest in the world. It's a several billion dollar industry that is really built from the mass incarceration system. Medical neglect is really a feature of the system. People who go in having chronic medical conditions come out much sicker. And people who go in healthy come out sick. There have been countless deaths, many of which have been found by medical experts to be avoidable. Nopi was hearing from families and people inside detention and advocates about the abuses that were happening in immigration detention. They were seeing the consequences of immigration raids in the community. And Nopi's focus was not only on advocating for individual cases, but really holding these immigration jails and prisons accountable for the mistreatment, for the abuse, and for the deaths. Nopi organized a medical providers network, which is a community community legal partnership that's meant to link community members and legal advocates who are representing people in immigration jails to volunteer medical providers and really built this network that trained clinicians in how to write medical advocacy letters, how to advocate for cases in the media to support their immigration case, to really advocate for their release. At the start of the pandemic, we knew right away this was going to hit immigration jails really hard. 
It's infectious diseases which really thrive in these detention facilities because they're designed to be like super spreaders. People are confined in crowded conditions. Their immune system is already weakened by the stress that they're under, but also by the lack of nutrition. You combine that with lack of access to adequate soap and water, and this is where infectious diseases really thrive. So our work has become more urgent in the time of COVID because the health consequences are much greater. Nopi and several of the volunteers in the Medical Providers Network actually came together to draft an open letter and really called on ICE to take urgent action to release as many individuals as possible from immigration detention. I've been involved in over a dozen cases. One case in particular comes to mind, and that's Abdi's case. His health just continually declined. And by the time that I met him, he was having trouble breathing, having chest pain, and that was all a result of a misdiagnosis of active tuberculosis. Nilpi helped us to draft an op-ed to really bring public attention to what was happening, the ways in which immigration detention itself had made him sick. He actually did win his freedom and was reunited with his family, and I think that the evaluation that we did was really essential to that. We know that there's this really intricate connection between mass incarceration and immigration detention. Our network already had a group of trained clinicians with experience in doing evaluations in jails and prison settings because that's where immigration detention centers are usually placed. In the time of COVID, our work shifted from just immigration alone to actually writing advocacy letters for people who were in jail. Oftentimes there was short notice and, and cases were urgent. We've had a lot of success as a network in connecting with legal advocates and community advocates and getting people released from immigration jails. We also work to bring attention to the systemic conditions in immigration jails and in really moving towards community-based alternatives to detention. Rikers Island is a human rights crisis where brutal, inhumane things happen every day. It has existed for roughly 100 years, isolated. That is made up of about 400 acres of landfill that is toxic. From the inception of the Close Rikers work, it has always been about centering the voices of people who have been most impacted by the harms caused by Rikers Island. We want folks, groups, to identify what their intersecting issues or priorities are in achieving the closure of Rikers. We began working with NILPI in 2016, and they guided a lot of our work around how could we divest from the justice system and invest in community infrastructure. The way that NILPI engaged in that was by facilitating a group working around health and environmental issues and identifying where are there opportunities for green infrastructure to create green jobs. NILPI was able to contribute a lot of their research and the findings about the environmental impacts and what that meant for human beings who were subject to being on Rikers Island physically. What they wanted to see was that Rikers Island could never be used for detention or incarceration ever again. In doing a lot of that work with NILPI, we had discovered the priorities of the Renewable Rikers work and identifying that with so much land available on Rikers, making sure that it was something that could benefit all New Yorkers, not only survivors of Rikers Island, but environmental justice advocates and other community members got together and developed this plan that could transform this toxic island into green infrastructure, creating thousands of jobs. NILPI is always been able to support directly impacted communities in the same way that they ask for directly impacted communities to support their work. Being able to have that understanding between us and NILPI has been tremendously helpful. The Close Rikers work would not be where it is today if it were not for our partnership with NILPI, who built a deep relationship with us and our members that said like they were committing to this for the long run. And no matter how complex the fight to close Rikers got, groups like NILPI continued to find ways to use their expertise and their priorities to advance the work that we were all doing. So we're talking about transforming something that has been used to brutalize and traumatize generations into something that is such a gift for all eight million of us in 
New York, there's no better way to define restorative justice. NLP has been a really important bridge in really being able to connect medical providers and the communities that we serve with community activists and advocates to support individual campaigns and greater campaigns. I think in many ways it's been incredibly inspirational for me to see the attorneys rise to the occasion, to view it as vital to the survival of the communities that they are committed to and to the communities that are most in need. Nobody's a force to be reckoned with and they know exactly what needs to be done just to protect the interests of the people in the community. I'm so glad to partner with Nopi because they give me hope. Wow, what moving and powerful stories. I suspect some of you might be hearing them for the first time, but as a board member, I get to observe firsthand so much of this extraordinary work by our extraordinary NILPI staff. In a year like no other, a year when NILPI's work took on even greater urgency, their heroic efforts to organize communities build coalitions and litigate alongside partners like all of you has made a massive impact on the lives of so many New Yorkers. I'm inspired every day by these achievements and I hope you have been too. Uh, if we were in person right now and uh, I hope we will be soon, uh, I would ask all of you to stand up and join me in applauding their commitment, their resolve, and their tireless work during this remarkably challenging year. For those of you who have joined in this work with your time and your skills and your heart, thank you. For those of you whose firms have generously supported this event, we thank all of you and we give a special nod to our top sponsors, Davis Polk, Morgan Lewis and Morgan Stanley for their generosity. For those of you who have personally contributed contributed to NILPI, uh, we thank you. And for those of you who have not yet had a chance to contribute, well, it won't surprise you to learn that it's not too late. We're asking you to help us reach our goal of raising $2 million for this event and for NILPI. And we're within shouting distance. We have $47,000 to go, and I know we can do it. So I hope you'll indulge me for just a few minutes. This is, um, this is the interactive part of this uh, virtual event. Uh, we're about to start our, our text to pledge, which um, as some of you may know from previous events is, is your chance to show your support for New York lawyers for the public interest. So you can contribute any amount, a dollar, $10, $100, $1,000, contribute any amount right now and your message and your pledge will go up on the screen over the course of the next few minutes. And if you're looking for any um, additional incentive this year, your gift will be matched up to $20,000 by our extremely generous honorees, Jamie McKeon and Eric Grossman. Thank you so much to Jamie and Eric for that. Um, if you text the pledge, right now you can actually double uh, the impact of your gift. So I would ask that um, each of you, wherever you may be right now, uh, please consider doing that. So how do we, um, how do, we do it? Um, first, take out your cell phones um, and create a new text message on your phone. Um, then just enter the number you see on the screen, 646-956. 2366, put that in the address line, uh, and then type your name or your firm name, uh, the amount of your pledge, and any short message that you want to share, and then, and then you just hit send. Uh, if you want your name to appear on the screen, include your name. Um, if you want to be anonymous, that's fine too. Uh, the goal here is 100% participation. That's really what we're shooting for. As I said, any amount uh, that you can give is going to be uh, very welcome and very much appreciated. And we're going to be so grateful if uh, if you can do it. And I can't emphasize enough that 
really gifts of any size will make a big difference. Every dollar will help NILP create a more equitable New York for all. Um, so your phones may be out, but uh, if they're not and you're going to uh, grab them, let's just take a look at what your gift can do. So $500, um, it's on the screen, supports a special education parents workshop. $1,000 provides legal and medical advocacy for seriously ill immigrants. $2,500 um, could host a pro bono clinic on finance and legal needs for nonprofits. Uh, $5,000, we can build the next generation of diverse justice advocates with an intern stipend. Um, and if you're feeling particularly generous today, uh, for $10,000, we can help transform Rikers Island into a renewable energy hub. Um, so let's uh, let's start. Let's see um, if I've been at all uh, persuasive in the in the past two minutes. Who's going to be our first person to text to pledge? Good. <laughs> we have uh, we we have we have someone. Um, Ann Madden, thank you so much. That's extremely generous. And um, let's just share your message, which is certainly a sentiment that we all share, Jamie. Uh, I continue to be inspired by your leadership and commitment to inclusion and diversity. That is something that um, we all we all share. Sharon Bowen, thank you so much for your donation, $1,000. Uh, we all congratulate today's honorees and, and featured speakers. Alfonso Grant, $1,000, thank you. Uh, Round Rasmussen, two hundred dollars. New York, uh, Nilby's work is uh, is so inspiring. Uh, if you need, you know, any, any reason to contribute today, just think about the um, how this past year just brought out the very best in um, in Nilby and its staff. Kim Sweet, thank you so much, and of course we we also share uh, in in your message congratulating uh, Eric and and Jamie and really for all their work advancing the cause of, of social justice. Thank you to News Corp for their $3,000 donation, to Rachel Strong uh, for $100, and, um, and to um, Ellen Holman, wow, $5,000, thank you. Eric, thank you so much for your donation. <laughs> go Nets, I don't know, I'll say go Knicks, but I've been saying that for many years and um, it's done no good. Jack Schmidt, thank you so much for your generosity. We're getting there. We're getting to uh, to to twenty thousand, which is going to be matched. Mark, thank you so much for your donation. Steve Adler for your extremely generous donation. Um, let's let's uh, let's keep it coming. Uh, there's so many good reasons to give. We're not in person, and so you're not pressured by you know the person sitting next to you who who may be giving. But there's so many other good reasons to give. Thank you, uh, Karen Hughes. Hopefully, you've been inspired by the stories that. You heard today. Hopefully, you are uh, inspired by this incredible Nilpi staff. Um, hopefully, you're. In thank you, um, uh, Nexus C at Oric, two hundred fifty dollars. Thank you. Uh, so we're at forty-one thousand. Thank you to to Jamie and Eric for matching the uh, the contributions so far. We're only about six thousand less than six thousand dollars away from reaching two million dollars. Um, you should be, you can be, hopefully you are inspired by all the great work that Jamie uh, and Eric have done over the years to advance the cause of social justice. Wow, thank you, um, Doug Schwartz, for your generous donation. We're just there. You may be inspired um, by so many things that we've experienced over the last year and all of the good work that Nilpi does. Um, you could just perhaps hope that I get off the screen, and if that's the reason that you want to give money, thank you. We did it. $54,000, $55,000, dollars from Lorraine McGowan. Thank you so much. Lynn Nooner, $1,000. Thank you. Erin, thank you for your generosity. I wish I could see you in person today. Fiona Kelly, thank you uh, for your generosity as well. Um, Ed Maloff, thank you. Um, we agree. Nilby is just doing critical work um, that is so essential to our local communities. Rebecca Morris, thank you. Amanda Smith, thank you so much. We are so grateful for this outpouring of generosity right now. 
Jen, thank you. Samantha Greenfield, thank you so much. See if there's a couple more coming um, and we will wrap this up. This is gonna be available uh, certainly for the rest of this program, for the rest of the day, for the next week. So if you don't give now, uh, you can give another time. And again, we are just so grateful for any dollar that you can give. Um, thank you, Ken Walliter. Thank you, Sheila Boston, uh, for your generous $200 donation. This is remarkable, um, $64,000 uh, from this text to pledge. I'm guessing it's a record. Somebody will tell me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, John Thompson, thank you so much. Um, and and uh, Doug Wingo and Tim Legg, thank you. Okay, uh, we, I'm so happy with all of what is coming in right now. Um, and keep it coming throughout the program. But we're now we're gonna we're actually gonna go back to um, to the program uh, presenting the awards today uh, to our incredible honorees. Uh, our Ann Ewers, President and CEO of Kimmel Center, presenting to Jamie McKeon. Uh, and Kim Sweet, Executive Director of Advocates for Children of New York, presenting to Eric Grossman. Um, and our wonderful honorees will be in conversation with the extraordinary uh, Loretta E. Lynch, who, as probably all of you know, is the former Attorney General of the United States, whose illustrious legal career has included both private law practice and public service, including, impressively, three presidential appointments. Thank you. Sweet, and I'm the Executive Director of Advocates for Children of New York. I'm also a proud New York Lawyers for the Public Interest alumnus, so I am particularly honored to have the role of introducing Eric Grossman, one of the wonderful recipients of this year's Law and Society Award. Eric joined the Advocates for Children Board in 2010 and has been our board president since 2013. His leadership and dedication to the organization have been nothing less than transformative. He is an amazing fundraiser, as many of you know firsthand, as well as a gifted leader. He has enough humility to trust the staff on the ground, but also enough intelligence and experience to give us valuable support and guidance when we need it. But I was thinking about what makes Eric so special, and I think it's just that he's a really good person deep down. I discovered this back in 2010, before he joined the board, when he agreed to co-chair our first spring benefit. One of our clients came up to the podium to speak. This young man had come to our office at age 17, reading on a first grade level because he hadn't ever received the support he needed to address his learning disability. We had taken his case to a hearing and gotten him specialized reading instruction, as well as a placement in a school where older youth could catch up on credits and now he was on track to graduate. Well, this young man came up to the podium, looked out at the sea of lawyers in dark suits, and completely froze. There was this horrible moment when I didn't know what was going to happen. And then I saw Eric, who I barely knew at the time, rise up out of his seat in the front row, walk up to the stage, and reach out his hand to this young man, who took it, and from that gesture, got the reassurance he needed to be able to give his speech. And that was the moment when I knew that Eric Grossman was the real thing. His commitment to our mission, to advocating for children who face daunting obstacles to a good education is true and profound. Eric, I have been so privileged to know you and to work with you in service of this commitment that we both share. You personify the public-private partnership that is really at the center of Nilpi's work. Congratulations on this well-deserved award. Hi, I'm Ann Ewers, President and CEO of the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia. With over 9,000 seats a night, we are the second largest performing arts center in the country, second only to your Lincoln Center. Jamie McKeon is a board member valued tremendously. She serves as the secretary of our board and she is also on the executive committee. So her commitment to the Kimmel is so marvelous that when I was asked to introduce, I embraced this chance. Jamie comes from a family of 
absolute Broadway lovers. Everything from attending performances to gathering around the piano to sing. More than once, Jamie has texted me in the middle of one of our performances to say, Anne, get me tickets. I have to see 